My name is Jordan Pease. I'm the director of Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library, and I'm very glad you all joined us tonight. Um, our library has been uh, in existence since 2001, and we started off with a lot of focus on the UFO subject, uh, but we haven't done many lectures in the last 22 years, uh, at least in Ashland, on this subject. So as you all saw when you walked in, it's UFO month here at the library. <laughs> and I know you all saw what's uh, scattered around this room. In a few minutes, I'm gonna ask the camera to pan the room so the viewers online can see what's in this room. I do wanna take just a few minutes since I have this opportunity to put myself on camera for two different things. Um, so I'm gonna start with this one. Some of you might be familiar with a man, a researcher named uh, L.A. Marzulli, um, who's written several books and produced the man's name is L.A. Marzulli, and I know a lot of people watching online will know who this person is. So I had the occasion to present to L.A. Marzulli this uh, artifact that I happen to have. And so those of us that have studied the, the UFO phenomena are aware of the elongated skull phenomena. And I'll leave this. We can look at it afterwards as well. And I could say a lot more, but I'm just going to... Leave it at that. <laughs> okay, one more thing I'd like to share with the video camera. <laughs> oh, and I hesitate to just a little bit. <laughs> um, in the last year or so, I have been going out bragging to my colleagues and friends about <laughs> nobody's been to more UFO conferences than me. So I thought I'd better back that up a little bit. And so I just happened to, as we unpacked all the items in this uh, room, I just happened to come across, well, not happened, I knew they were in the boxes, so these are all my conference badges from <laughs> all the that I have attended over a... <clears throat> okay, there's my proof. <laughs> oh my God, I got applause. <laughs> okay, thanks for indulging me. Thanks for indulging me. <clears throat> Thanks for indulging me on that. I don't want to spend uh, any more of your precious time and the people online watching this online. Welcome all our viewers online. This is for the benefit of the people online. In a moment, I'm going to ask Steve. Oh, God, it looks like he's on the phone with Danny right now. Uh, uh, so with that, I I'm not going to introduce my dear friends and colleagues, mentors, because you've all read their bios, and I think a lot of you are aware of who these uh, esteemed uh, gentlemen are. There's about, arguably about five people, I would say, uh, in the UFO research community that are articulate and is knowledgeable and is uh, tenacious, is maybe the best accolade I want to give to these men uh, in this field. I bet, met both of these men in my work with uh, Dr. Stephen Greer in the Disclosure Project in 2001. I'd certainly known these men from attending <laughs> all the conferences I've been to over the years, uh, but I didn't get to know them and become friends until about the work with the Disclosure Project. These men and myself have had so many tremendous adventures at the conferences. I tell people it's one thing what presenters will say at the podium. It's a whole other thing, especially the, the experiencers, contactees will say at 2 o'clock in the morning in the bar with... <laughs> Some, some drinks in them. So I've learned a lot at two, three, four o'clock in the morning at the UFO conference. Um, so anything else I need to say before we start? Oh, I started to say, and that's why I asked um, Missy Galore, our camera operator, to pan the room. I would like Steve to start this. And Steve, can you please um, share with the audience here what the uh, 1952 CIA Robertson panel is about and how it relates to the items that are on display here in terms of how the public's psyche has been um, influenced by the wide array of both movies, certainly, and all the paraphernalia, I don't know the word for it, the collectible objects that have ET and UFO themes. Do you want to speak to that, please, Steve? The CIA Robertson panel, 1952. Uh -huh. I have said many times that the informal beginning of the truth embargo was when uh, they grabbed Mac Brazel off the street in uh, Roswell took him into custody and, how would you say, chatted with him for about a week and uh, were able to persuade him to uh, change his story, uh, which he did. They gave him a new truck and then he later moved out of town. But the formal beginning of the truth embargo for me starts with the Robertson panel. The government handled the issue pretty well. Even though a press release went out, ah, mistakes happen. And, um, Everybody went back to recovering from World War II. Sightings are happening. No, 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 no big concerns. And then in 1952 in July, the ETs, apparently irritated that we were just not giving the attention it richly deserved, 
flew up over Washington for days, days. And unfortunately, we don't have any photos of that, but we have a very substantial written record and, and even a video record of, in, of uh, statements that were made by various people. And it scared the hell out of uh, the United States government, and maybe rightly so. Uh, the, the audacity of them, yeah, many craft cruising around over the Capitol, whatever. And so they said, uh-oh, we've got an issue here. We've got to deal with it. So let's pull a panel together to make a decision about that. And actually, it was a CIA panel, of course, led by a gentleman by the name of Robertson, came to be known as the Robertson panel. It's distinguished by being very much, all CIA, very much CIA, completely male. And they met for a while and came up with a report, the Robertson report, which I don't believe was, was, was classified. It came public many, many years later, if I'm not mistaken. And the report could have come to the conclusion, look, these things can fly over the Capitol whenever they want, or anywhere else for that matter. And we do have a body and a crash vehicle, and this whole thing could get out of hand. Let's just tell the people. Let's get uh, President uh, Truman out there. And uh, well, I would have been Eisenhower at that point. And, 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 and tell the people the truth and, and tell them nothing to be concerned about, and we'll get more information to you. That's not the conclusion they came to. The conclusion they came to is the phenomena, and I'm not, I'm not making this up, did not appear to be a threat, but the public's intriguing interest in it, growing interest in it, could be upsetting, could be a problem. I think they referred to the fact that reports could come in and they could be confused with, I don't know, missile attacks from the Soviet Union, whatever the hell. And so we basically need to just embargo the hell out of it. But they didn't use that term embargo, but that's what it was. And that became the policy, formal policy, and they started really building the truth embargo at that point, and they were very serious about it. And so for me, that's what the Robertson panel represents. We do have the report, and it pretty much confirms what I said. I'm not, I'm not criticizing these gentlemen. They had to make a decision in their time under those circumstances. I wasn't there. But obviously, they changed history profoundly. If they had gone the other way, uh, the, uh, uh, the path not taken, uh, who knows what the 20th century would have been like. Let me just add to that, Steve, if I might. Thank you for that uh, analysis and how it pertains to what's in this room, especially some of these Hollywood movies. So the unredacted version of the Robertson panel report that was released by John Greenwald, a hero in this field, a lot of you people will know, um, it literally names Madison Avenue advertising companies, the Walt Disney Company, and many others to, with taxpayer funding to create spin um, to... to the ridicule factor really is around these subjects in Western cultures is really to do with what was done with the Robertson panel. Would you concur, Steve? It's, I think, fairly accepted that in the early days of the truth embargo, post-World War II, remember, we won that war, and then there was another war going on in Korea, remember that war? And so the United States government was king of the mountain and, and, and very well loved and liked by the American people in the world. And so consequently, Whatever it wanted to do, people are going to help. And so I, I am, I'm quite sure that publishers of certain papers were contacted, certain members of the you know, movie industry, television, were contacted discreetly and told that we'd like a little assistance in controlling or maintaining an issue of grave, grave concern and potential national security implications. And I, I can't imagine anyone saying no. And so I imagine this did take place in the early years. The history of that may be lost forever, but under the new act that's uh, going to be passed hopefully soon, we may get it all. Who knows? <laughs> I would certainly like to know. Uh, it's, it's important uh, because this is a significant thing. There's a degree to which our civilian companies and organizations and media should not cross. Did they cross it in, in the uh, 50s? I, I, I can't say. That's for historians to determine. I'm going to ask Danny to speak just a little bit on that, too. Danny, do you have any comments on uh, a propaganda campaign? Well, uh, I, th I think that the, some of the best data that we have on this, uh, Richard Dolan actually gathered through the Freedom of Information Act. He's published it in his, uh, two his original two-volume work of uh, UFOs in the National Security State. And he's gotten the internal memos from the Defense Department and from the Central Intelligence Agency explicitly uh, directing their operatives to go into the field and suppress information coming out about this phenomenon. They, 
you know, that we, we've seen the other letters, the, the letter from General Twining and others, where they've repeatedly stated in classified documents that they're aware of the UFO phenomenon, that these are not uh, illusions of any kind. These are not just flocks of birds. They're acknowledging in their own internal memos that uh, Dolan secured that they realize that these are actual craft, uh, that they seem to be metallic in nature. They, they fly at these extraordinary speeds, and uh, they're, they're far in excess of anything we have. And, of course, they're aware of the fact that they're in excess of anything that the Russians have at that time, immediately following World War II. I mean, they'd lost over 20 million people in World War II. Uh, and as, uh, as Lou Elizondo has said in a closed-door meeting that we had with the Associated Press, they certainly weren't Chinese, he said. Uh, back in that time, in the 1950s, the Chinese said the, the major mode of transportation in China were ox carts with stone wheels, <laughs> he said. And, and, so these, and he said, we've been observing this phenomenon since 1947. Uh, and he was very candid about this. And so are the documents that Richard Dolan has secured. I mean, virtually everybody who is listening to this and who are there gathered with you up there in Ashland, they should absolutely get a copy of uh, Dolan's uh, two-volume uh, UFOs in the National Security State. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, more dense reading than a lot of people might be inclined to do just for entertainment. But, I mean, you've got the documents right there. You can leaf through the documents. You can see the, the, the classified stamps on them that have now been released through the Freedom of Information Act. And they outline the history, the choreography of this whole program to actively suppress uh, the information unto the point of destroying uh, people's careers, uh, ruining their family life, uh, destroying their occupations by contacting their employers uh, and, and saying that they're crazy. And virtually any, any military pilot that tried to report a sighting of one of these UFOs, the first thing that happened is he was immediately ordered to go get a psychiatric exam. Uh, you know, under the rubric of, oh, we're, it's really important that we make sure people realize that you're not crazy, so let's us have you go get a psychiatric exam, <laughs> you know. Uh, so th this was not exactly a career builder uh, at the time. Uh, and I uh, say, Dolan has laid that out in, in great detail, uh, very calmly and directly. Now that we have the documents, there's no reason to become uh, over-hyperbolic about the whole thing. It's just a matter of fact, historical fact, that that is what they did. Thank you, Danny. I would certainly count Richard Dolan among those five people that I was re referencing earlier. Dr. Stephen Greer is another person I would uh, uh, count as a very articulate, well-spoken um, and well-educated um, researcher on this field. And of course, right on the other side of that wall, we have more than a couple copies of the books that were just mentioned. And I encourage you all, if you haven't seen it before, very impressive collection right on the other side of that wall. OK, so uh, this is really your time audience this time. We asked people ahead of time uh, on our uh, uh, web calendar to submit questions ahead of time. I think we have questions. I don't see them quite yet, but I just want to make sure that we're going to allow, make sure the audience knows that we're going to allow for at least an hour's worth of questions. But I, I want to give these men time to make op opening remarks um, about the work. And what Danny just said, that up until about, what, two weeks ago, there was no official channel for especially military people to be reporting their signs. And Danny already spoke to the repercussions that <laughs> many, many civilian Professional. airline pilots and especially military pilots have suffered uh, in their careers and worse, like Danny just mentioned. I mean, that's a whole book in itself, the, the kinds of things that uh, heroic people who have come forward to say, I know what I saw. <laughs> I know what I saw. There's a title of a movie right there, literally. <laughs> other side of the swell as well. So um, I, I don't know if you caught the, the point that I just made. So Bill Nelson, the director of NASA, what, two weeks ago, um, yeah. officially announced that they're reopening or maybe establishing for the first time NASA a, a, a conduit, a, a mechanism, a way for people, military pilots and other people to, to um, officially report. In some ways, you could say that's just such a baby step toward what we really need to be doing to study this issue. But any progress is significant progress. So both these men can say a lot more about that. Um, Danny, do you want to? The, the title of this lecture is, you know, uh, boots on the ground in, in D.C. A lot of stuff's been happening that both of these men are very privy to. That's not making the six o'clock news. This is the opportunity I want to give you all to hear from these men the most current information about what's happening in the disclosure project, and then allow probably about an hour's worth of questions. So we have about forty minutes, Danny and Steve. 
do you want to just go ahead and frame that? I'll start with Danny, please. Sure. That uh, that uh, both Steve and I have offices now. We've opened up, you know, in Washington D.C. at two strategic places. Uh, Steve has his office in the National Press Club, uh, you know, right where the uh, one of the original disclosure meetings was held back in 2001 at the National Press Club, uh, and that he's got his offices right there where we can hold press conferences, uh, gather the, the the national and international press together to brief them on this. That uh, our new paradigm institute uh, of the Romero Institute has just opened offices at the uh, 110 Maryland Avenue that is the only civilian building inside the federal enclave on Capitol Hill. Uh, we're right in between the United States Supreme Court and the Russell uh, and Senate uh, office buildings. You know, we, we can literally walk across the street and, and go to the meetings of the Senate Intelligence Committee and meet with their staff. So we're, we're uh, based in Washington now to, to uh, pick up on this movement that is underway right now. Uh, that Stephen, Stephen has been forecasting this now for some time uh, that, you know, no matter what people think, uh, the reality is that there are going to be hearings in the United States Congress where you're going to have Congress people confronting uh, people from inside the executive branch, confronting them with the accusation that they've been lying to the Congress, they've been lying to the elected representatives, they've been lying to presidents uh, and secretaries of defense and the heads of the Joint Chiefs, <laughs> denying that they that they know anything about UFOs, uh, that uh, everybody's crazy, that still keeps thinking UFOs are real, uh, and so that we've we've entered into a new era now, which uh, which uh, Stephen will you know give people some of the history of here, uh, but we're we're now in a in a situation where you know. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, going around the country uh, talking with people about this. I'm going to be coming back uh, into our office in Washington uh, on the 15th of this month. I'm going to be meeting with people in the Senate Intelligence Committee, with people over in the, the House uh, 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 Oversight Committee, uh, who are going to have jurisdiction to uh, help set up a, a, a panel, of which that, uh, Steve and I will talk about here this, this evening, uh, a panel that's going to be appointed by the president to actually extract from every single one of the, the six uh, military services of the United States, from all 18 of the national intelligence uh, agencies, from all the different branches of the uh, in offices and agencies of the Defense Department, and most importantly, from all of the, the private corporate military contractors, uh, any and all information they have. Uh, pertaining to the UFO issue and the potential existence of extraterrestrial or non-human uh, intelligence. And very importantly, in the statute as presently drafted in the Senate, uh, they are exercising eminent domain over all in any of the materials that have been recovered by the United States government uh, of any crashed UFOs, any biological evidence of extraterrestrial or extra-dimensional life. Uh, and uh, and this is this is a major uh, issue that's going on in Washington. I mean, the the, the fact that uh, Kevin McCarthy just got ousted this afternoon uh, as the Speaker of the House for the first time in history is going to overshadow uh, the news uh, issues for uh, several days, you know, until next week. <laughs> but but the bottom line is the real discussion, the real deep discussion going on in Washington right now is, you know, who's going to be on this panel. Uh, and how much access are they really going to get to this information? This is this is not just the story of the century. This is the story of the of perhaps the entire lifespan of, of our human family uh, to actually start to discuss in open forums the reality of the fact that there is an entire extraterrestrial civilization that we find ourselves in the midst of. Uh, and like the, the primitive islanders on a tiny island in the South Pacific in the mid-1950s, uh, we discover that there's an entire world going on outside our island, uh, and we have to start preparing for this. And that's going to be the nature of the conversation that Steve and I are going to be having with all of the elected leaders uh, in Washington uh, over the period of the next, between now and December 22nd, uh, when the new National Defense Authorization Act uh, is going to be enacted, and it's going to have this major section, a 64-page section, setting up this new panel 
to extract this information from all the agencies and make as much of it public as possible. Uh, and Steve and I will be discussing tonight uh, how we work all together as citizens to limit whatever information they put into a special category of wanting to postpone the public revelation of it. So th this is an extraordinarily important phenomenon that's going on right now, and it's virtually impossible to uh, overstate its importance. I'm going to thank you, Danny. Obviously, very powerful statements were just made there, and I think, well, I don't want to speak for the room, but uh, I think a lot of us would concur <laughs> about, about this pivotal moment in human history. And I wanted to interject and have Steve explain what I'm going to call my take on what that pivotal moment really is on a calendar date would have been uh, July 26th this year when the first congressional panel um, was convened about this. Both Danny and Steve were present at that panel. Steve, can you introduce who um, David Grush is and why his testimony really takes this all to the next level and maybe make that as a segue into what occurred at the Congress there on uh, July 26th this year? Sure, but I think initially I need, I need to make some important points. First of all, it's obvious that Danny has much better lighting and much better cameras than I have. <laughs> and I'm, I'm working on that, okay? I got some cheap stuff here. I, I accept that. The other point is that you may see behind him a very substantial library of books. These are the things you have to read in order to get multiple PhDs from Harvard. <laughs> we, on the other hand, have behind me a 30-foot wall mural of the Milky Way Galaxy. Look, I, I have put something up on the net, and I, I sent out links to this to lots of people, but some may not have it. But what I've done is taken all the language from the 2226 20, Senate bill, the language that is going to be submitted uh, for the uh, 2024 NDA, and it's up as a highlighted PDF uh, file. The address is not complicated. It's paradigmresearchgroup.org. A lot of people know that, paradigmresearchgroup.org, slash 2024 hyphen NDAA hyphen Senate. We'll put that link in the YouTube Ash description. Yeah. We'll put the link in the YouTube description, okay. Steve. Can you please you please talk about the July 26th hearing and David Grush? I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. <laughs> I I'm, I'm being mindful so of our time, Steve. Find it, right? I did, by the way, Danny has also his own version of it. He's already got the language and he has been studying it for weeks and weeks. He's got thousands of marks and things on that page and everything as he's, he's sorted it out. But he didn't put it up on, on the web. <laughs> I did. I, I serve. I am of service. All right, look. Uh, <laughs> David Grush. Well, let, me, let me start this way. Thank you. Um, no, there it is. No, there, I'm telling you. No, yeah. But it's, it, it, it's not online. Uh, the process underway to end the truth embargo is not easy. It's not simple. And it's taking far too long. It should have taken about two years tops. Unfortunately, history just doesn't care about our, our schedules and our hopes and our dreams. And so global massive pandemic attendant huge economic disruption, followed by maybe the most nuclear risky war in, in all of history, followed by, well, strikes and God knows what. And oh, oh yeah, complete madness in Congress. <laughs> Total mental breakdown in Congress, absolutely. Unprecedented things, having every other day, okay? If they all showed up tomorrow in clown suits, people would go, yeah, I knew that was coming. <laughs> and so it slowed things down. It dragged it out. And that meant that whatever script they were following, and I, and, I, and I say script loosely because it's not as like there's a single script and they all get together and rehearse. They are both, there are many, many entities that are sort of watching each other as they move forward with some sense of what to do. And so there is a kind of script there. But the longer it takes, the more likely somebody's going to rush the stage or one of the lighting fixtures is going to fall down, black swan events, that type of thing. And it's taken too long. And David Grush is that black swan event. I'm not criticizing him at all. But he was going to do what he was going to do, and eventually he did it. And what he did was simply this. He became the first what I consider true whistleblower to show up on this issue in, in the appropriate way. He had had enough over a period of years while working for the uh, Unidentified uh, Air Aerophenomena Task Force, UAP Task Force, where he was tasked with receiving information from people as part of the programs that are being developed. But in the early days, it was probably a little looser, 
not quite as tight as it's about to get, but uh, a lot of people contacted him with extraordinary information, which he appropriately passed on to the appropriate entities, such as the Senate Intel Committee. Steve, can you please and give an example of some of that testimony? Can you please give an example for the audience that doesn't even know who David Grush is? About well, he's, the, the he's a major, and he was an intelligence officer, and he was assigned to work for the UAP task force, which was assigned to address the UAP issues. And he was given a lot of information, some of which was extraordinary, namely a number of people, significant people who we knew by name and who they were, informed him that, yes, we have crash vehicles and non-human bodies. Well, that's a big deal, not simply because it confirms Roswell. It basically confirms the whole shebang. Ball game. It's over. Except David Gresh is not the president of the United States. And so he appropriately went to the Intel Committee with this information. But that information was not supposed to be put in play at that point. We were following a track, national security, witnesses coming forward, things like that. But bodies and, and crash vehicles re-engineering no 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 that was too soon so but the reason he came forward he's getting threatened he went to the uh, intel uh intelligence community ig got relief and i assume the people back in his offices and around him kept their mouth shut and left him alone unfortunately just like restraining orders as every separated woman will ever tell you they don't really work that well and so it's easy to threaten people without anonymously and he was getting those, including death threats. He went to the Arrow to talk about the issue as well. They didn't do anything because that's not in the script yet. And so he was really frustrated and angry. And he made an extraordinary historic decision. I am going to be really the first whistleblower to come forward and really shake the trees. He needed media. He, he got in touch with Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal, a former Pulitzer Prize winner at the New York Times. Uh, they went to major entities like New York Times, Washington Post, I think some of the networks, with one of the great stories of, of, of the last many years, but it was too huge to, for them. Something like that, because they have enormous liability as, as huge professional media entities, they simply couldn't just put it out, and he wanted it out. He wanted it out fast, and so they all passed. It's okay. I'm not criticizing for that at all. But the debrief didn't pass. It's not... The New York Times, but it's pretty damn good. And so they wrote the article, and Ross Coulthard, of all people from Australia, got the interview. News Nation, a brand new, very heavily financed media outlet, which I think is hoping to become a sane version of, of Fox, after Fox is sued into oblivion, to the interview. June the 5th, I woke up in the morning, people were running around the hotel in Indian Wells with their hair on fire. I said, okay, what is going on? And they said, <laughs> and so uh, finally we sorted it out. And we all got in a room together and watched this interview in Indian Wells all together in one room uh, live. I, I just need to give the context. Uh, yeah. Excuse me, Steve. So it, it was me, Steve. Cause... This was the interview of, uh, of, that, that he gave to Colthart where he, he, in that form, tells the public, hey, this is what I know. All hey, right? Danny, why don't you take it from there? Because you were present on that podium with uh, Richard Dolan as we as we premiered that News Nation interview for, it's called the um, uh, Contact in the Desert Conference was held in June in Indian Wells. That's where Steve's referring to. Danny, do you want to talk about that very exciting moment, June 6th? Yeah, it, well, it's, uh, it's extraordinary because I had, I had met David Grush because, uh, as people may know, that I'm the attorney for Lou Elizondo, who <laughs> was the head of the, for 10 years, uh, basically headed up the, uh, the top secret Pentagon uh, investigation of the UFO phenomenon. It went on from about 2007 to 2017. Uh, and uh, Lou, along with Chris Mellon, is the, the one that, that came forward and delivered the videotapes to the New York Times that hit the headlines everywhere in December of 2017. This sort of marks the beginning of the kind of unraveling uh, of, of these stories. Uh, and what happened is uh, right away, Lou Elizondo's security clearance was challenged, as was Chris Mellon's. Uh, and the person to whom the review of their intelligence uh, 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 security clearances was given to review was David Grush. Uh, and David Grush was, had been made the head of the new task force that when Lou Elizondo resigned, uh, from the head of ATIP, which was the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, 
in protest uh, and brought the, the, the videos to the New York Times, the Pentagon wanted to pretend there never was any such thing. So the Pentagon shut down a tip uh, so they could say, oh, there is no such thing. And there's no such operation in the, in the Pentagon. We don't know who uh, Lou Elizondo is. What they did is they transferred the, the project over into the Office of Naval Intelligence, uh, and they called it the UAP Task Force. Uh, and uh, Dave Garouche was one of the people, he was assigned from the, uh, the uh, Geo, Geo Global uh, Intelligence Center uh, to, to actually uh, be one of the main investigators. And as he started gathering the information uh, in the wake of the closing down of ATIP, uh, he started becoming astonished at what the nature of the information was. Uh, and he proceeded to do the same kind of things that, that uh, Lou Elizondo had done. He began to go to extremely high-level military officials and try to get them to tell him more and more about what was going on. And while he did get some 40 people to come and talk with him and acknowledge the existence of these, uh, the fact that we were in possession of an intact uh, UFO, non-human extraterrestrial spacecraft, and bodies uh, in connection with those craft. But he, in fact, was insisting upon getting more information, and they were shutting him off. And so what he did is he made a decision that uh, he was going to resign as well. Uh, and uh, I began having meetings with him, uh, uh, and he was wanting to reveal this information, uh, that we were all involved in providing legal counsel to him, we finally, uh, uh, he ended up getting the attorney who was the former inspector general for the U.S. intelligence community to become his lawyer. Uh, and uh, the lawyer obviously counseled him, Chuck, uh, counseled him to, to come forward, and they coordinated by setting up a, uh, a meeting in front of the oversight committee of the House of Representatives, their national security subcommittee, and they came forward on July 26th uh, and he testified. Uh, I mean, I think that th the fact is, is that there were a lot of people in the room that weren't even quite aware of the extraordinary nature of what was happening <laughs> as he as he began to tell them, uh, you know, yes, you know, we're we're our government has been in possession of an intact uh, extraterrestrial uh, non-human spacecraft. Uh, and there's evidence of bodies, uh, biological uh, evidence. He referred to it. Uh, and I think, you know, a, a portion of the people that were on the committee didn't even quite grasp the, the import of what he was saying. <laughs> the, those of us who knew about him and knew what he was getting ready to say, we knew what was happening. Uh, and so what we've done is, is I went immediately and met with two of the members of the House Oversight Committee, uh, both Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, and Jamie Raskin, uh, and, uh, and said, here, what you really need to do is talk to Dave Grush in private because he can give you the names of the people who know exactly where the craft and the various crafts are, uh, where the biological evidence is of extraterrestrial life, uh, and they'll be perfectly willing to talk with you uh, because you have the adequate security clearances. And while he couldn't re reveal those names and those locations of the craft right out in a public statement without violating his national security oath, he is able to give them the information. And that process is underway right now. Uh, Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Danny. In interest of time, I'm going to move us on to something else. Unless, Steve, can you, can you do it in 30 seconds? Do you want to say anything about that hearing, July 26th? Until I, I take... was there. Yeah. It was one of the most important moments of my life. Uh, it was conducted well. On three occasions, uh, members of the, of the uh, Republican members of the subcommittee stated, matter of factly, this is a nonpartisan issue. It was conducted by large in a nonpartisan way. It was one of the few things that's happened on Capitol Hill in months that made sense. <laughs> All right. Thank uh, you. David and and I'll, an I'll put in, anybody that's not aware of the July 26th hearing, I'm speaking to the YouTube audience and, and the audience here. It's easy to Google that, and you can watch the hearings for yourself. It ran about oh. two hours, I believe. I watched it, of course, live with great excitement and was 
glad to see my friends there, <laughs> although I knew they would be there. I thought it was very notable, this is my own little comment on that, uh, that they, witnesses stopped just short of talking about what's known as the nuclear weapons tampering issue as it relates to, uh, to UFOs. Danny, do you want to make any comment on that? And, and give credit to the man, Dick Haynes, who's authored an extraordinary book on that subject. It's not just domestically that this has occurred, all the way back to the 70s. Richard Danny? Hastings. Uh, Hastings, excuse Hastings. excuse me. Excuse me, Richard Your Hastings. Book. Danny? That's right. And, and, and Bob Salas, of course, yes. is that the, uh, the, the reality is, is that Bob Salas and, uh, and actually Colonel uh, Dewey Aronson uh, have, have both come forward and publicly talked about the fact that back in 1968, uh, a major UFO came over the top of their Minuteman uh, missile uh, site in Montana uh, and shut off all 10 of the independently wired uh, uh, international uh, missiles uh, of the United States, the Minuteman missiles. Uh, and, and the the effort that Bob Salas went to and, and, uh, and Arnie Arnoldson, rather, that they attempted to bring this information to their superiors and nobody wanted to do anything about it. Uh, this is one of the things that struck Lou Elizondo as so bizarre. He said, how is it possible for a UFO to appear over a Minuteman missile site and shut off all of our nuclear missiles and have the Defense Department not do anything about it? You know, that it struck him as some kind of, from his, his perspective, a threat to our national security. Uh, and yet he kept saying over and over again, the people at the very highest levels in the, in the military don't seem to be treating this as a national security threat, uh, almost as if they knew something that he was not being told. Uh, and so he, that he and, uh, and David Grush both became extraordinarily frustrated and in a democracy like this had the option of going out forward to the people and talking to the people about it. And that's what's happening now. The people are actually starting to rise up uh, and insist that Congress do something about this. And Congress, to be, to be blunt about it, Congress, I think, is responding more out of their having been embarrassed uh, that, that now the American people realize that the Congress is being lied to uh, and the Congress hasn't been doing anything about it. And that's what's happening now. We see the Congress reflexively reacting to being embarrassed by the fact that these whistleblowers are coming forward and talking to the national media and telling the people about this and the Congress has been sitting on its hands. And so what's happening now is the Congress is coming forward and there's an actual dialogue going on now between the Senate side, basically the Senate Intelligence Committee on the one hand, and on the House side with the House Oversight Committee as to who is exactly going to choreograph these hearings, you know, and what kind of coordination are they going to undertake together to get these hearings handled in a sound and responsible way. And that's what this bill is all about, The Senator Schumer has produced. Senator Schumer is now proposing that a major... Uh, panel be established, a board be established by Congress and appointed by the President of the United States and, and given ratification by the United States Senate so that both the executive branch and the congressional branch are going to be demanding that the military and the private military contractors turn this information over and these materials over to the Congress of the United States. And that's what's happening right now. Thank you, Danny. I just want to make sure, because I don't, don't think the audience here or online uh, understood how uh, prevalent the nuclear weapons tampering issue is and how far back it goes. Danny just talked about a case in 1969, um, but I know this has occurred many other times, lots of other witnesses, courageous men coming forward. You don't give the nuclear launch buttons to crazy people, I think, right? So these are the kinds of people we can believe uh, when they make these kinds of testimonies. And again, they're, they're courageous uh, stances on that. So I also know this has all been reported in uh, the Soviet Union. I don't know, maybe Steve can uh, illuminate that a little bit more, how many instances and beginning in about the 60s that those kinds of instances have, have occurred. Obviously a very significant instance, as Danny already said. Dan, uh, Steve, do you have anything else to add to that? Well, the, I, I would add this, that the uh, closest we've come to nuclear war was the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Uh, very close as subsequent historians have found out. It was almost over. I remember I was just, I was in high school and I'm sitting there going, oh, this is it. I'm not gonna get to graduate. <laughs> uh, and uh, only four years later, 
just four years. They showed up over, this is the case before Malmstrom in 66, and they turned off a flight of missiles. We don't have, I don't know if there's witnesses to that one, but I think there are. <clears throat> and then they did it again and again, going out through the 60s and 70s. At the same time, they were doing it in the Soviet Union. Coincidence? I don't think so. And so the nuclear weapons witnesses are probably the most important of all, even more important in Russian way, because there's more involved here than just there's ETs here or not ETs here. Believe me, it's way bigger than that. And I can assure you that those witnesses will testify in front of the Senate Intel Committee, along with Grush, and maybe some of the USAP people that told Grush about the bodies and the crap. So if you're thinking the, the Intel Committee hearings are going to be like the recent half-day subcommittee hearing in the House, think again. Thank that you, Steve. Probably enough to bring about disclosure. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. I'm just trying to move this along so we can get as much information out as we can. Before I take audience questions in about 10 minutes, um, I'm going to ask Steve, actually, to speak to the issue of, well, reverse engineered technology. Um, <clears throat> people will know the name um, uh, Philip Corso, Curl of Phil Corso. That book was written. It's called The Day After Roswell is when that book was written. Other people have come forward, but in my opinion, that's the most credible witness or claimant uh, because of his position in the military and the kinds of things that are talked about in that book. Um, Steve, do you want to give a thumbnail about reverse engineered technology and how it falls down all of our pockets, literally, potentially, cell phones. Mm -hmm. Do you want to speak to that, Steve? Corso's book was, he was quite old. It was written by Bill Burns, not by Corso, from other notes. And he does get into the fact that they might have tried to diffuse some tech from the Roswell crash through the foreign technology desk. But it's messy and very difficult to confirm. Uh, so I don't, I don't invest much time in it. Uh, maybe the microchip came from that crap, maybe it didn't. The technology we should be concerned about, and, well, concerned, we should really want to know about, and may be a, a, a life-saving matter for us, is you can be sure uh, that they have tried to figure out how they fly and the energy system that flies them. And I think they have made progress there. There is quite a bit of evidence that we have our own version of an anti-gravity craft, which I assume means we may have the energy system, or we could be flying them with our own conventional energy, which may explain why they're larger, perhaps, and the design is different. Whatever the point is, is that that's energy and anti without getting into microchips and other stuff and tubes and things that might have been passed around. It's, that's not important. Energy and propulsion, paradigm shift breakthroughs could transform this planet. And one of the tough questions they'll be answering after disclosure soon is why did you hold it back so long? Why did you, why didn't you get it out there a little sooner? It's been a rough ride out here and they'll have to have an answer for that. And it'll be national security. But those are the two technologies we should focus on. Thank you. And I should have prefaced my uh, comments about that book day after Roswell. It is it's very messy. And so you have to take some of that with a grain of salt. But again, that the let, let, let me let me make a, let me make a point here, uh, Jordan, that that uh, I, I found to be extraordinarily important. The, the little eight millimeter home movie that uh, that uh, Colonel Corso actually uh, produced to be shown to his grandchildren after he died. Uh, this this is this I, I found to be extraordinarily persuasive that he and I got to see the film, uh, but it wasn't supposed to be shown till after he died. And, uh, and I was shown the film, uh, and it shows him talking to his grandchildren, saying that even though I'm gone now, I wanted to make sure you understood this. And what he did is he talked about the fact that back in 1945, in July, uh, when before we had even dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, while well, they were experimenting with the nuclear bomb uh, out in the desert at uh, Alamogordo in White Flats uh, that in uh, New Mexico, he, he, in fact, was one of the, the security officers there, uh, and he said that they were seeing UFOs. He told his grandchildren uh, from, the, from the grave, basically, on the, on the little 8-millimeter home movie, that he had been there and that saw the UFOs and that he took a lunch break to go leave and went off into the hills somewhere to go to lunch, and he saw one of the craft that had landed. Uh, 
uh, it had been somehow disabled by the radar that was up all around the proving grounds. Uh, and the, he had a direct contact with the UFO occupants of the vehicle. And, and they, they communicated to him telepathically to please take down the radar just temporarily to allow them to flee. Uh, and he actually did that. He told his grandchildren. He went back and, as a range officer, ordered them to shut down the, the radar for just a, a, a short time to do some kind of recalibration of it. And at that point, the UFO craft fled, uh, shot off into the sky. Now, that's, that's Corso talking to his grandchildren in a, in a private, never intended to be made public, uh, eight millimeter film. And so I found that quite convincing about Corso. Uh, so when Corso reports that he was actually put into possession of some of the technology that had been recovered from the Roswell crash, I tend to give it a, a, a considerable amount of credibility. And the fact that the, the various uh, aero, uh, aerospace uh, corporations try to set forth some sort of a long explanation about how they really developed the silicon chip they really developed the fiber optics. They really developed uh, the other uh, uh, technology that Corso attributes to the Roswell crash. That's exactly what they would do. Uh, they, there's not any doubt about it, that they would obfuscate and they would try to construct some sort of an alternative explanation for how they developed themselves this technology. And uh, so I'm just saying that uh, I find the Corso uh, uh, testimony more credible than many people do. Thank you. The reason May I, I add something, uh, Jordy? Just a sec, Steve, please. The reason I chose to kind of give some focus before we take questions is uh, on uh, the nuclear weapons tampering issue, reverse engineered technologies issue, and maybe one other I'll squeeze in. A lot of people will say, hey, Jordan, if you're really so excited about the reality of a UFO cover up, what, what, how does it have any effect on the ordinary person's life? Very good question, of course. <laughs> There's many answers to that, the implications to theology and science and technology and lots, lots of these different things. But I think that's a very fair position for the average person to take. Why should the average person care about secrets that might have been held back for so long? So that's why I'm picking those couple of issues to give some expert um, assessment on. Go ahead, Steve, please. The, the single most important thing about the UF, UAP ET phenomenon, in my view, in terms of our future, uh, what's coming next, and the, the problems we're facing, is the relationship between the ETs and the nukes. And that is where I'm heavily focused, and you want to pay very close attention to that. Um, I just went, I just saw the movie Oppenheimer by Christopher Nolan. It's an absolute masterpiece. Uh, it's it's a long movie and it's complicated. I had the, the good fortune of being able to read Richard Rhodes's uh, incredible Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Making of the Atomic Bomb. If you read that book, uh, 800 pages, it really makes that movie a little easier to watch. But the movie gets into the, the, the issues and the complexities and the emotions and everything else of what was going on as we're building that bomb. And, it, and, and, and for me, that was very profound. I was riveted to the screen because those things also apply to the ET issue, and they are absolutely connected without question. And so um, uh, I want to add that, that this, one of the most important things that's going to come out of the hearings and where we're going is we're going to find out why this connection exists. And I think the answer is, is a favorable one for us. Thank you for including that, Steve. So right on schedule, we're going to be audience questions now, okay? You're, you all ready? Um, we're not going to be able to get through all these people. So Nikki's already kind of pre so we uh, get as many as we can. Uh, several people submitted them ahead of time, but I'm going to give reference to the audience here in the room. Um, so back to the T July 26th hearing, David Grush and his colleagues that testified before Congress, this is a question from somebody in the room named Tony. What has the response of the Congressional Intelligence Committee, and why, not, why aren't, aren't the sources being named, and by what authority are the crashed items classified? Danny, do you want to take that one, please? Sure. That, uh, look, one, one of the things that's extraordinarily important to, to note here, uh, by way of sort of caution, uh, the, the real dynamic that's going on right now 
is the Congress of the United States trying to get their hands on the information. Uh, they feel that as the legislative branch of the government, uh, and there's a United States Supreme Court case uh, that actually rules that it's the legislature that is the government of the United States primarily, it's not the executive branch that is just in charge of enforcing the laws that are passed by Congress. Uh, and it's not just the judicial branch that passes on the laws, it's the legislature. Uh, and, and the reality is they're the ones that are insisting upon being put into possession of this information. Now, they're making a lot of noise about the fact that on behalf of the people that elect them, they are inclined to want to reveal this information as much as possible to the American people. But the, the reality is, is that one of the major challenges we're going to face as the American people, as the regular people of the world, is that the people in the Congress, once they get their hands on this information, are very likely to be inclined to classify it, uh, to allow just themselves to have access to this information uh, for purposes of their legislating. Uh, but that they're, they're not going to be inclined to make it available to all the rest of us in the world, that they don't really see it as necessary to share with us. Uh, and so that those of us who are in the public who want to have this information to be able to make the most profound decisions that we're ever going to make in our lives as to what the nature of our relationship is going to be with the extraterrestrial civilization for the next 10,000 years is something that all of our people have to be involved in deciding. Uh, and that's why we're putting such pressure on to get this information released to us publicly. Uh, and that's that I just want to make that clear that even the statute that we're talking about here, the UAP Disclosure Act, it's called the Controlled Disclosure uh, Program. And therefore, they have a whole provision in there, Section 5 and 6, where they allow the executive branch agencies and even the private corporations to request that the information that they have and the materials that they have continue to be classified uh, and not revealed to the public. So that there are two, two fights that we have to engage in. One is to get the information disclosed to Congress out of the hands of this secret cabal uh, of, of military contractors and some sort of progeny of the MJ-12, the Majestic 12 group that was appointed by Truman back in 1947 to secretly coordinate this program and hold it secret, you know, that we're, go we're going to have to first get the information turned over into the hands of Congress. Then we're going to have to work hard to extract as much of this information as possible from the Congress itself. Now, this is going to confront all of us with a question that virtually none of us have gotten ready to prepare to be answered, and that is exactly what rationale might exist for them legitimately withholding some of this information from us. Uh, is there any such category at all? Uh, you, sir. Yes. This idea that we... Steve won't like me saying this. <laughs> Danny said it, but I just wanted to expand the point a little bit. Eisenhower's last speech as he left office, beware the military industrial complex. A lot of people read into that, that statement by that powerful man that these technologies are not under control of the elected government. This is a very important point to understand. These technologies have been gleaned from crash technologies, cr crash saucers and things, sequestered into military contractors, literal underground laboratories. And so it's not like you know, congressional orders are going to get the doors opened on those, on those labs. Even though this is kind of thing that David Grush is is um, is advocating for, I, we all hope that that might occur. Steve, do you want to jump in on that, please? I don't see it that way. Um, I disagree. But I, 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 there's not even a remote amount of time to uh, to sort that out. Let me let me say this because we are short of time. The 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 bill that is now out there by the Senate and up on the site for everybody to see anywhere in the world. If you've got a computer, no matter who you are, great or small, you can read this language. Originally put forward by Schumer, but Schumer is not a member of the Intel Committee, so now it is now assigned to and sponsored by Senator Reid. So he's the fourth senator of the Senate Intel Committee to sponsor language in these four tranches now of legislation, three passed, one soon to be passed, Rubio, Warner, Gillibrand, and Reid. And every single member of the Senate Intel Committee signed a letter 
to a uh, couple letters. I think one went to uh, Arrow, one way made it get to the White House regarding the issue. So the Senate Intel Committee, the entire committee, is fully on board to move this forward. And secondly, this, this current bill is, is the bill to end all bills. The first three were interesting, constructive, and so forth. This one is massive. Uh, I put it on a PDF, and it's up online, as I mentioned. It's 25 single-spaced pages. It has got a huge amount in it. And there is enormous, significant things on every every paragraph. I was highlighting it red, and I realized I'm going to have to highlight the whole damn thing. I encourage people to read it from beginning to end carefully, and it's not easy. Do you think reading Ulysses by Joyce was tough? This is tough. <laughs> but I want to make a very interesting uh, suggestion to people. If you read this entire bill, I want you to imagine something. Imagine that one week after the bill is passed, which will be later this year, the president actually comes forward, confirms the extraterrestrial presence. Boom. Right. Then look, read that bill with that in your mind. Confirmation has already come. And so we're reading this bill that passed. And what you will find, I think, is what I found. Every single thing in that bill, every single thing in the three previous bills that were passed, is completely applicable and will be conducted even after disclosure. In other words, all of the structure and all of these uh, uh, processes and the funding and setting everything up, whatever, will even be more and actually will be needed post-disclosure less than they are now. Now it's more of a show to get to disclosure. After disclosure, all of this legislation will really be uh, important, but it'll be important at a time when the cat's out of the bag. And so I'm not too worried about what we're going to get or not get from the government. I think everything I'm seeing is they are going to do the right thing. That's my opinion. Not everybody shares it. Uh, but that's where I'm at now. I could change. But again, read that bill and ask yourself, after disclosure, all of this is going to be needed, really needed, and probably very well funded. That's it, what I want to It's say. hard for me as moderator to keep things in a... You know, if, so I'm going to have to skip around to get these get these questions answered, um, and some really great questions, insightful ones. I should have said at the beginning, though, this is about government secrecy disclosure. There's so many other things surrounding us in this room: uh, abductions, cattle mutilations, crop circles, lots of other uh, s subjects dovetail together here. It's, that's too much for tonight. So I, I, a few questions are asking about those I sort got of all night. <laughs> We're going to quit at nine. That's what we do. So we got another 55 minutes to answer these questions. Um, uh, so forgive me if I'm skipping around. Uh, some, I'm just going to give this next one to Danny, Steve. Uh, one of our uh, colleagues named Victor Vigiani up in uh, Canada uh, is apparently yeah, watching and has submitted this question via chat. Both these men certainly are aware of a journalist named Victor Vigiani. His yeah. question, uh, how might the Vatican's wealth of knowledge about this issue fit into the current situation, Danny Sheehan? <laughs> Funny you should ask, Victor. Uh, yeah, no, that, that uh, uh, my, my direct involvement in this all started officially back in 1977 when I was uh, right after President Carter was elected, and President Carter demanded uh, access to the UFO information from the CIA director at that time, who was George H. W. Bush, uh, and Bush refused to give it to him, uh, and so President Carter asked the Congressional Research Service to do a major study for him, to present information to him about the UFO phenomenon, because as you might know, uh, he had seen a UFO. Uh, and so he wanted to get this information as president, uh, and the CIA refused to give it to him. So we engaged in this, this uh, study, and one of the first things that Dr. Marshall Smith uh, asked me to do, who was the head of the Congressional Research Service, Science and Technology Division, was to contact the Vatican, because I was legal counsel for the Jesuit National Headquarters, uh, their big national office of social ministry in Washington, D.C. at the time. And I reached out to the Vatican and asked if we, as the Jesuit order, could uh, get access to this information to determine what might be shared with the president, the new president. Uh, and the archivist said, no, we couldn't have that. Uh, uh, I have now gone to Rome, and I've talked with uh, not only the head of the Pontifical Observatory, uh, uh, the Father Johann, uh, uh, well, Johann Ix is the archivist, uh, and I talked to Father Jose Gabriel Funes, the head of the observatory, to try to get them to share this with us. 
they have not agreed to share it so far. Uh, now, the, the, the church, it's extraordinarily important. I want to make this point. The church has issued an official statement, however, the Catholic Church, which is the largest single denomination in all of Western civilization, so it's no small thing. They have actually stated that now it's clear that we're going to be very soon confirming life el elsewhere in the universe and that the time has now arrived for us as the lay people to start having very serious discussions about the profound philosophical and theological implications uh, of the discovery that life exists elsewhere in the universe. And I flew immediately to meet with Father Funes after they issued the statement. And he said to me, look, Dan, you know, we're not talking here about the discovery of some single cell life form under some frozen sea on some distant moon in some far off <laughs> galaxy. We're, we're, we're talking about another highly intelligent, highly technologically uh, developed, uh, but non-human species right here in our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and this is what we have to start getting our people prepared for. Uh, and so that this idea of how we're going to coordinate getting this information that has been kept secret for so long uh, by these authorities like the Catholic Church. And I've talked about this with Johann X, who's the archivist there. You know, I've requested the information uh, in my capacity as legal counsel at the Jesuit headquarters in our social ministry office, the public policy office. Uh, and uh, I'm still engaged in this process. I'm uh, going to be going to meet with Cardinal Peter Turkson, uh, who is uh, the number two to Francis uh, over there. You know, Francis, as you know, is the first Jesuit uh, ever to be chosen to be pope. Uh, I'm hoping that we're going to have more progress here. Uh, as the Congress comes forward, as President Biden appoints this, this new commission to extract this information and start sharing some of it with the American people and the world, I'm hoping that we're going to all be able to play a major role through our new Paradigm Institute in Washington, D.C., in getting this thing to happen. Thank you, Danny. Thank you for all the work that you've done on this issue over your whole career, going back to the Carter administration in the 1970s. We were going to hang a picture of Jimmy Carter. We just didn't get a chance to do it. Um, uh, okay, Steve, for you, uh, and I, this is absolutely Steve's wheelhouse. I don't actually see it here, but this is a good place to do it. Which presidential candidate is going to be most likely the one to make the disclosure of the current field of candidates, potential candidates? Uh, yeah. Uh, I have an easy answer for that. Doesn't have an answer. Danny, do you want to have a it jump in on that? Matter. Disclosure is going to come from the current president. Whether he deserves it, whether he knew early on, doesn't matter. He is the president who gets the last chair when the mu music stops. What I'm concerned about is if we do not get this done, if we do not get confirmation of the ET presence done, and pretty much everything is in place to deal with what comes afterwards. Try to imagine if the president had come four years ago and said, yeah, there's ETs here and we had disclosure and none of the legislation had happened yet. None of the structure was there. There was nothing dealt with in Congress and they're gonna to try to put all that together while the world's running around with his hair on fire. No, all of this is preparatory to that. But if we don't get it done, then this coming election, which will be an election for the ages, will probably be talked about by historians for hundreds of years and not favorable, uh, is going to get even worse. Because as these people are trying to become president of the United States, hanging over them is the fact that the, the presence of ETs and crash vehicles is now out in play and being covered by papers across the world. And Crush is giving interviews. And Lord knows what else is going on. And, 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 and what are they going to say if somebody asks them about it? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. Right. Or get me something really stupid. It's going to make complete fools out of these candidates. And they don't have a lot of, how would you say, room left to not be a fool. They're on the edge all the time. And so that's my feeling about it. And, and it's not just the presidential candidates, the people running for House and Senate. It's absolutely critical that the people that are voting in what will probably be an eight or nine billion dollar election that they are able to get legitimate statements from all these candidates as they decide who to vote for relative to and pertinent to the ET issue, not conjecturally, but after the fact, meaning there's disclosure, ETs are here. Candidate, what is your thought about that? How do you intend to proceed? What do you think we should do? How should we respond? Otherwise, we'll just have another election where nonsense is blathered out, everybody lies, 
and nothing really changes. We need disclosure before this campaign gets underway. And I'm happy to head on up to the Senate and, and speak with the Senate Intel Committee about my convictions about that. Uh, I'm not very far away, only about 12 blocks. <laughs> Thank oh, you, by Steve. the way, my office is not in the National Press Club. I'm sure the board of the club would be very startled and surprised to hear that. It's in the National Press Building, just two blocks from the White House. I got that close because, you know, if any positions open up in the Department of Extraterrestrial Affairs, I can walk right over and interview. So that's how that's going to go down. I, I used the word tenacious earlier. This is what I'm talking about when I when I think tenacious. And blessing to you, dear brother, for all that you've done. Both of you great men. For dog with a bone for most Danny's of your career. Danny's greater, much, much greater. Uh, Danny talks to popes and generals and presidents and heads of committees and God knows who else. I just stand on the perimeter making acerbic uh, oh, remarks. He, he's being very humble. Steve has been, nobody works harder at this than Steve does. Makes Well, yes, they do. But Steve's, <laughs> in, in my That's world, right. the people that I look up to, it, it's men like these two people on the screen. Okay, uh, I'm going to give this one to you, Danny. And thank you, everybody, that's been submitting questions. And some of these came from around the world. So here's one from uh, Gabor Knish. In Hungary, I'm going to summarize it because it's long, but it's an interesting question. It's a dichotomy, uh, I would say. So I'll read the middle paragraph. Three weeks ago at the press conference that we spoke about, Bill Nelson of NASA uh, did clearly state that, quote, all of the sightings close to Earth have not been related to non-human intelligence. In other words, planet Earth is not being visited by so-called aliens in flying saucer. This is more science fiction. Uh, this is not more than science fiction or fantasy. But then this person, uh, Gabor in Hungary, uh, makes the point that um, from the standpoint of David Grush that we spoke about, uh, talking about the, and, and Steve said it correctly, the, the, the quote in the testimony isn't dead alien bodies at all. He just said biological materials is as far as he would go. And that's an important point. Biologics, non, I, I believe the word non-human was used. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. We don't need to get semantical. He's exactly. plenty of other places, and he's, he says. But that's why I'm saying dichotomy. So we have we have official leaders, NASA and, and correct congressional people. Um, well, I should say military people, David Grush, uh, giving contradictory testimonies. And so for the rest of us trying to make sense of all this stuff, that of course makes it as hard as it is to get to the real truth of this. Danny, do you want to speak to that, please? Did, did I make sense of the question? I hope. Yeah, sure. Both sure. cannot be okay. true and relevant, is what the person ends their their question well, with. The, the, the reality is, is that, uh, you know, 99 percent of the elected and appointed representatives in the various government positions, legislative uh, and executive branch, in fact, have not been briefed in about this. I mean, this this uh, secret process of containing this information and not sharing it with other members of the government uh, has been extraordinarily successful in a peculiar way. Uh, and the, the thing is, is that people who work in government uh, are, are a specific kind of people who understand that they have to respect the pecking order inside the hierarchical structures of government or else they'll never go any higher uh, in that structure. And they're aware of that. And so that they, they do not challenge uh, the people that are above them uh, and do not demand to know information that they haven't been told they should know. Uh, and so that that uh, Bill Nelson is a very nice guy and a, and a very, a very well met fellow. Uh, but uh, he he in fact is wrong on this. Uh, I'm not going to attribute to him conscious willful lying about this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say that he's among the the 99 percent who've not been briefed in. The problem with elected leaders and others is that they pretend they know things that they don't know, and he thinks he knows that it isn't true. That, that we've been citing, you know, UFO craft and that they're extraterrestrial in nature, that he just doesn't know that. Uh, but he's not humble enough to acknowledge that he doesn't really know about it. Uh, and so that it's, I understand that he thinks he's perhaps telling the truth as far as he knows. But, there, but the reality is, is that the evidence abounds over the past 75 years that it's been abounding uh, that, that this is happening. The, the question remains as to whether all of the sightings are extraterrestrial in origin, or whether there may be some other phenomena going on, such as, interestingly enough, an extra dimensional uh, species, uh, is, is strange as that sounds, 
uh, that may be functioning here as well. Uh, but the reality is that extraterrestrial life does exist. Uh, there are, in fact, uh, uh, other uh, highly intelligent and highly technologically developed species right in our galaxy. Uh, the, the reality is that they have, they have conquered the issue of superluminal travel. Uh, the reality is they have been coming here. Uh, they are here now. They've been here for some time. Uh, and the, re the United States government is on the brink now of having to acknowledge this reality. Uh, and that we, as the citizens, if we do our job uh, inside the democratic polity and we force the people in Congress as a condition of our willingness to vote for them, again, to put them in those offices, uh, that they're going to extract this information uh, and get it into policies in our country. Because the time has arrived for us have to have to bring in this higher level of consciousness of who we really are, where we fit into the galactic scheme of things, and get rid of these potentially totally self-destructive thermonuclear weapons. That has, been the, that has been the word over and over again of people who've had direct contact with the extraterrestrial beings uh, and the, the occupants of these UFOs who keep saying that you've got to take steps to get rid of the nuclear weapons because you're going to not only potentially destroy your entire species, but you may well threaten to kill the life-generating capacity that your planet has, that our Earth seems to be one of, not the only one, but one of the comparatively rare planets that actually gestates life. Uh, and so this is, a, this is an extraordinarily important planet uh, in our galactic scheme of things, and we have to preserve it. Uh, and if we don't do our job uh, and preserve this planet, uh, there is a chance the steps will be taken to make sure that th the planet is protected from us. Powerful stuff here, people. Um, thank you, Danny. Very articulate and uh, thorough answer to that question. The summary for the purposes of the questioner, the way I took it, is, and it's a really important point, and a lot of people don't realize this. Uh, elected people in government, elected leaders in many different branches of um, our society are just not briefed in on this. And there's an arrogance, in my opinion, that, and perhaps Bill Nelson, I'm not Me. saying it as politely as Danny just did, uh, you know, if it was that important, I'd know about it. And that's another way to, to think about this. Uh, Steve, I'm sure you have some comments on that. Do you want to give, give a reflection on that? I know I'm smart enough to know not that argue or debate with Danny Sheehan. Say <laughs> <laughs> this. And I, I'm, I'm never going to pitch to Aaron Judge either. Um, I have a different, somewhat different view. Uh, and again, I've said this many times. And it, and it is why people are very confused when someone says this and someone says that. Maybe they've been briefed, maybe they've not been briefed. I think more people have been briefed than we might imagine, at least to, to the degree that would be significant, not necessarily everything. The point is, is that what is going on now is not about finding out what this phenomenon is. None of it is about that at all. They know. And if they connected and they have access, they know, including the president. It's about setting up the infrastructure in order to deal with the post-disclosure world. The departments, the entities, the funding, the uh, uh, reporting structures, protection for witnesses, all of this stuff, which is, which is profoundly covered in this bill, I mean, in depth. It's about setting that up so when the, the president does confirm the ET presence, they're ready to deal with it. And in order to get to that point, they just can't just do it. They're having to go through a lot of... It's politics. This is a political thing that's happening. And you know how politics is. Hell, they can't even pass the funding bill. I mean, you're talking about some of the most important issues of our time, like gun control and other things. They go round and round on it for decades. I mean, it is politics is not easy. And this is a political thing that they're doing. And it's moving pretty fast, by the way. And so what Bill Nelson might say or what's happening at Arrow is all in service to oh, I know this and I'm going to tell you that. It's this is what I can say as part of this process to keep it advancing towards hearing and towards confirmation by the president. And for me, see, I don't have this cognizant dissonance when I watch all this because it all fits together quite nicely. But for people that don't know the history of this issue, 
that, that actually believe the government just found out not too long ago, oh my God, there's something in the sky. We've got to get to the bottom of this. I'm sure they're kind of com confused. That's okay. It's all right. So I'm asking people to relax, not get too overwrought about the details and this and the thing that happens that happens there. What's important is the full process ends up where it needs to end up. In the East Room of the White House, at the end of Cross Hall, in front of a podium where the president will tell a lot of media in that room, I've seen these, I've heard this testimony, I've watched it with you. It, com it clearly confirms an extraterrestrial presence. And you're going to find out more about this. I'm going to see to it. And we have a whole lot of structure and so forth and processes to get access to information. And we're ready to go. How coincidental is that? That's my take. Thank you, Steve. And right as you're talking about gun control, I'm, I'm wondering if it, perhaps it's not an uh, uh, issue related to uh, just our planet. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> Everybody's holding guns in the start. It's an example of the fact that it's difficult to get things done in Washington. I'm not trying to get into uh, other areas uh, that I'm not an expert in. Um, a good segue to this next question, who's asked by our uh, chat moderator on the YouTube live uh, stream, is uh, Kate Chasse in Toronto. And it's a follow on to what Steve just said, I think, and what Danny Sheehan held up that document a few minutes ago. So Kate's question is. Uh, where did the UAP language originate from for the amendment introduced by Senate Leader Chuck Schumer? Uh, and, and was it apparently drafted in collaboration with White House officials? Did Danny or Steve provide input or anyone else in the UFO community like Lou Elizondo? Well, uh, Danny provided input. I, I did not, but I kind of know about UAP and its origin. But Danny? No, go, go ahead, Stevie. Go ahead. D define uh, UAP for people all, that don't know let, it. Let me mention, in the bill, the phrase... Unidentified anomalous phenomena appears 141 times. Not aerial, UFO anomalous. I'm sorry? Because a lot of people will mis misquote the acronym. It's, it's unidentified anomalous phenomena. I think it was actually right. changed from aerial well, phenomena has, to anomalous has, to include non-aerial phenomena. Yeah. They, have, they have been developing the language and trying to get the right wording with a little help from their friends and my friends. They, they, they landed on unidentified anomalous phenomena, which they very carefully define in the bill. It's perfect. And ARROW is an excellent name and an excellent acronym. All right. But it appears 141 times. UFO only appears once. And it's in a section where they're describing some previous ways that it was referred to. And the reason that a lot of effort was put into getting UAP and legitimizing it is because UFO was toxic, and you couldn't get the journalists and the, and, the, and, the, and the politicians to even utter the acronym. Because the moment you did, it was like saying a really nasty word on camera and immediately getting canceled. And so we needed language that didn't have the stigma. UAP did not have the stigma. You remember, you know, I put a lot of effort into this. You remember when Hillary Clinton was uh, interviewing by Jimmy Kimmel, and she said, oh, Jimmy, there's a new phrase now. It's un UAP, Unidentified Era of Phenomena. I take a lot of responsibility for her saying that, and she was right, and that was the real formal beginning of it. There's other language, like truth embargo and disclosure and so forth, that has serviced our activism, and the government has embraced it. The term disclosure turns up in that bill in a number of places. That is not an accident. They're sending a message to us. We hear you. We understand. We don't have to use that word, but we did. It's right in the title, right? One of the, sub one of the two titles of the bill is, I think, the UAP Disclosure Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Reid. Thank you, Senator Schumer. I happen to believe they are doing the right thing. I happen to believe they absolutely intend to disclose. And I only say that because I am paying very close attention from a larger perspective and not getting too granular. Not simply because I really want disclosure. <laughs> yes, you do, Steve. No, no. <laughs> I'm giving you a very good uh, professional assessment. It's righteous, and it's going to end up landing where it has to land, and that's the confirmation from the president. What do you have to add to that, Danny, please? Do you have anything to add Pardon? to that, Danny? Oh, uh, yeah, the, this, uh, the, this is a, uh, uh, it's, it's extraordinarily important to understand when you talk directly to Sean Kirkpatrick, who's the, the head of Arrow, uh, and you talk to the staff people who wrote the bill, uh, the, the, the reality is, is that there's an effort on the part of people who don't want to deal with the UFO phenomenon to obfuscate this, to have this include a lot of other things like Bigfoot, 
like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, other ghosts, uh, weird things going on at Skinwalker Ranch, you know, that, that they, they would love to have uh, a, a hundred different things that they could spend their time looking at instead of UFOs. Uh, the, 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 UF, the UFO uh, has become a lot more than just a general description of something that is unidentified. A UFO has become a specific noun. It's a, it's a, a spacecraft. It's an extraterrestrial spacecraft. It's usually a saucer-shaped uh, <laughs> spacecraft with a dome on the top of it uh, in there anywhere from 30 to you know, 50 feet wide. Uh, you know, that there, these, the UFO is a very specific thing. Uh, and we've spent 75 years uh, <laughs> drilling in on this. And now, as Steve has pointed out, the national security state has spent 75 years, you know, stigmatizing the entire idea of UFOs and that UFOs aren't real. Uh, and the, 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 reality, the reality is, is that those who are trying to solve the problem, as Steve has pointed out, have said, look it, let's call it something else. Uh, and so what they did is they went to the issue of, of the unidentified aerial phenomenon. And it became the original UAP. Now, in the Senate bill, when it, which was originally passed to try to set up the Joint Program Office to investigate this, which has now become Arrow, they actually had a, an interim phrase for it. They were unidentified aerial and undersea phenomena, because the, but they were still talking about the crafts. They weren't talking about ghosts. They weren't talking about Bigfoot. They weren't talking about you know, uh, portals and stuff on Skinwalker Ranch. They, they were talking about these craft that were flying around. Uh, and, and so that, the, in, in fact, when, when Sean Kirkpatrick, who's the head of the, the, uh, the Aero Project, when he was testifying in front of the subcommittee chaired by Senator Gillibrand, he said, look, uh, if, if there's something other than these craft that we're talking about, then it is... A uh, an S we call it S E or, or someone someone else's problem. <laughs> he said an S E P. It's someone else's problem. Uh, we're talking about basically these craft, uh, and so we're trying to stay focused on these because that's the key to, to, to key to everything. That, that focusing on these craft, the sightings that have been going on of the craft, the sightings of the occupants of these craft, the recovery of these craft the studying of the technology of these craft, trying to figure out who's behind these craft. That's the key. That's what we're talking about here. It's, it's not just some general anomaly that's going on. This is a very specific thing that's going on. Uh, and it's only anomalous in that it's completely different than the other kind of things that are going on on our planet. And it's anomalous to that. But the, the fact of the matter is we're talking about UFOs here. Uh, and, you know, and that we're going to fight our way back through this so that the citizenry who has succeeded in putting the pressure on to get this issue addressed is clear about what it is we're talking about here. We're talking about UFOs. We're talking about ETs. We're talking about an extraterrestrial civilization that has been coming and going for, to, to and from our planet for decades now and longer. Uh, and that's the issue that we've got to get Congress to come to grips with. OK, and that's what the people want to know about. That's what the church is talking about. That's what the church is talking about, our having to reflect upon the profound philosophical and theological questions that are posed to our human family by this realization that these are real. Uh, and that's that's really what we're dealing with here. Thank you, Danny. Let Again, something about good. Uh, sure, Steve, go ahead. Um, I did word search the bill for Bigfoot. Not there. <laughs> Right. We're, we're okay. Look, obviously, from the beginning, we knew, I think anybody that's followed the field knew, that there was going to be resistance, going all the way back to the To The Stars Academy's emergence, which caught a lot of people by surprise. And there was going to be resistance, and, and that was going to be very telling. How much? Who? Why? What? And all that. So I've been following that, trying to be watching for that resistance. And it has turned up in a number of ways. It turned up with respect to Elizondo. Gave him a lot of grief. Danny went in, settled it down. It turned up with Rush. They gave him a lot of grief. 
He went to the IG of the intelligence community. He got relief. He got a very good representative. There were early on a lot of silly statements from the Department of Defense because they were caught by surprise. They did not see those 10 people coming, but they corrected it. So I'm, I'm seeing some pushback, but compared to what's happening, the, the volume of events, the witnesses coming up, and the volume of media, and, 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 and not only that, let me tell you, the last two and a half years, I've been going back and forth from DC to LA. I'm involved in multiple media projects. Uh, this town is pretty much already on fire about this issue. Los Angeles. Probably means. every entity out there, every studio out there has got a couple of projects related to this issue. And I'm not talking fiction in the works. Mm. Uh, there's a, a, a film that just dropped yesterday called um, uh, We Are Not Alone. You're going to be hearing that mm. a lot. Uh, I think Danny's in it or something. I'm not sure. A lot, of, a lot of my friends are in it. We Are Not Alone, Elysium Media. But Spielberg just dropped a four series, uh, uh, essentially nonfiction doc on four major cases. It's getting huge views on Netflix. Let me tell you, this issue is going to unroll, unfold in two places as far as the United States is concerned and pretty much for the globe, Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles, the media and the politics. And I'm trying to be involved in both because I can. I go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Spirit Airlines, don't take a bag. And so uh, watch for that. I mean, there's a significant uh, uh, project that's going to drop on November the 2nd that I'm involved in. I can't say anything yet, but it's pretty cool. I can't wait to, uh, to be able to talk to you about that. Uh, so, again, uh, I, I have a much higher level of optimism and, uh, I, and, and, and for, as far as the resistance, it just isn't sufficient. And I, I expected it. It's not that bad. We're really winning. And I, and I was saying that in, a, in an interview I just gave her a documentary two days ago. A lot of people probably need to chill and realize we're winning. You know, we're winning the game. It's the bottom of the ninth. You know, the, the government's up. It's down three runs and two outs. So, like, you know, try not to suffer too much during these last months and weeks. Thank you again, Steve, for all that you've done for this issue over your whole career, 20 or more years. How long have you been at this, Steve? When did you start? 26 years. The best years of my life. <laughs> the, some of the hardest, I, I know. I really, they, they are the best years of my life. And they're gonna get better. I'm, I have some big plans for the next five years, I assure you. <laughs> Um, this is from a question of an anonymous person in this room, and it skips back to the uh, nuclear weapons tampering issue. So I'm just going to read the question. It's a little thick. I'm going to direct this to Danny. Can you hear me okay, Danny? I've got you. Yeah, go ahead, Jordan. Uh, I'm going to just read the question uh, verbatim here. Uh, with eminent domain, eminent domain is the thrust of this question. With eminent domain, can the new panel, speaking about the congressional panel, um, squash selected information and perpetrate the disinformation? Second question, are the nuclear disabling efforts of the UAPs an effort to prevent eminent great harm and destruction? Do, do you understand that question? No. <laughs> I kind of don't either, but I like the idea of eminent domain as a-, as a Well, I, I can, I'll, I'll make up an answer to a made up question. <laughs> uh, the, the, one, of the, one of the major provisions of this bill, this uh, Amendment 797 is what this is, uh, is that, that it asserts on behalf of the United States government eminent domain. Eminent domain is a power that is granted to the federal government in the United States Constitution, in the Fourth Amendment. It authorizes the government to seize property, private property, uh, in the interest of the public. Uh, and they, and they, what they've done is they've, in a provision of this bill, they've exercised eminent domain over any information that is in the hands of private contractors, government contractors, uh, to extract that information and turn it over to, the, to this board, that this, this uh, uh, UAP uh, records review board, and ordered them to turn the information over so that the information belongs to the official United States government. And they've, they've also exercised eminent domain over any materials that are in the possession of Lockheed Martin or Raytheon or Radiant Laboratories, or these other aerospace technology groups that are attempting to commandeer this information and make massive private profits out of it. You know, they've also commandeered now through eminent domain, 
any of the biological materials that have been recovered anywhere, that are in any possessions of any private laboratories anywhere. Uh, and this is going to be one of the major pushbacks that's going to happen. Uh, in fact, we're getting pushback from the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, who happens to be a congressperson from the state of Ohio, where they have a number of these powerful aerospace private corporations that want to get their hands on this technology, and they want to be able to secure the intellectual property rights and the patents on these technologies so that they can become multi scrillionaires in the future. You know, this is a major dynamic that's going on here. Uh, and that, that private, those private uh, corporations are going to try to get their hands on this technology and become wealthy with it. And we're pushing back very hard against that. We've succeeded in getting put into this bill uh, the assertion of eminent domain that is now taking pr pos possession of this information, making it available for all of the people. Uh, and we're going to stick with that. Uh, and that, but that's going to become a major source of pushback on the part of very powerful people in the Congress. Thank you, so that's, Danny. That's the first part of the question. I, um, that's the answer to that. Interest of time, I'm going to move you on to something else. We only got 20 minutes left. Steve, I'm going to just yeah. have you hold your thoughts. I know you have something to say on that too. I'm going to take oh, this. No, I'm good. I'm good. Go take ahead. this opportunity with Danny Sheehan um, to just elaborate slightly on that point, in regard to the legal protections that you offered to the. Disclosure Project witnesses in 2001, this idea that if all these uh, black projects were not congressionally sanctioned, that t take it from there, Danny. You could say it yeah. better than I can. The, 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 fact of, the fact of the matter is people, people have taken, uh, are, have imposed upon them oaths of secrecy uh, that are getting access to some of this information. The reality is, is that the, a great deal of the, the assertion of national security uh, around these issues and others is completely beyond any reasonable authority that is possessed on the part of the executive branch of the United States government. Uh, and uh, that one of the things we need to be very careful about here in the crafting of this legislation, that because this legislation has a provision in it that authorizes the holders of this information to seek to have the Congress agree to postpone making it available to the public, this, there's, a, there's a Trojan horse in this legislation, which is attempting for the very first time to seek authority and authorization from the United States Congress to keep this information secret, okay? Uh, that that there, there are vague portions of this statute that need to be remedied that, for example, allow them to prohibit the public release of information that would in any way infringe upon the national security of the United States. Uh, you know, that that phrase has already been declared to be unconstitutionally overbroad uh, and vague in the case of U.S. v. Gorin way back in 1947. That that is that is inherently vague uh, and overbroad, that statement. Uh, I had this issue when I was one of the lawyers representing The New York Times when the Nixon administration took the position that the revelation of any of the information within the 47 volumes of the Pentagon Papers, if publicly revealed, would irrevocably damage the national security of the United States. And so when I was in chambers with Judge Murray Gerfine and the lawyer for the Nixon administration, when I was representing the New York Times, I said, like what? You know, and they said, oh, well, we can't tell you because you don't have the adequate security clearances. You know, and then the judge said, well, what about me? You're here asking for an injunction against the New York Times to prohibit us from publishing this. You know, like you're going to share with me what you think is going to irrevocably damage the national security of the United States, aren't you? And Whitney North Seymour, the United States attorney for the Southern District of New York, said, no, Your Honor, we can't tell you either. Now, so there's a there's a, a fetish that exists inside the national security state about, you know, waving this magic wand of national security over this information, which we're going to have to deal with because we do not want this statute to become the vehicle by means of which these people who have been unconstitutionally and illegally withholding this information from elected representatives and from presidents of the United States, and yes, from the people of the United States, to think that they're now being given authority by Congress to conceal it. We've got to be very careful about that because this information needs to be revealed. The question that I keep putting to people, and this is the second time I've raised it, is you know, you need to start thinking about is there any type of information relating to the UFOs and the extraterrestrial civilization that you would think 
could legitimately be kept secret from the American people and from the people of the world who need to know about this information in order to make these profoundly important decisions about our future relationship with, the, with this extraterrestrial species. That most people don't want to think about that, but we're going to have to think about that in order to restrict the information that can possibly be kept secret to the narrowest conceivable category of information. And myself, I'm challenged to really understand what it might be. Uh, and and I, I haven't come up with a good answer yet. And so I'm still in favor of revealing all of this information to the people uh, until I'm persuaded to the contrary. Wow, thank you, Danny. Let's applaud that point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve, I'm sure you got lots to say on that too. No, I think uh, I let I let me. Again, if you have nothing say to say, well, then we're going to use the time. I, uh, I I really encourage people to read this full bill. Now, understand, it's just the Senate version. Some of it may not be in the final bill, but it in some ways doesn't matter because it sends a very powerful message across the entire world about where certainly the Senate and Senate Intel Committee is. And that's the most powerful, in many ways, most important committee in Congress. Read the entire bill, because when I finally got through it, I realized that pretty much everything they needed to have in place is now in place. The whole shebang, the works. Uh, the first three bills did a lot, but this pretty much took it home. So now everything is in place so that if confirmation disclosure comes, they're ready to go. And so that's something to think about. We're going to quit um, at 9 p.m. That's 14 minutes from now. I want to get a couple more questions in if I can. Yeah, that, that's all I wanted to add. Excuse me for cutting you off, sir. Uh, this one's directed to Danny, another person in this room anonymously. Um, I already said we weren't going to talk about sightings or things like that. I'm going to make an exception for this particular question. So I, this is for Danny. Danny Sheehan, what about witness accounts of UFOs arriving over Chernobyl and Fukushima nuclear disasters and radiation levels dropping? They appear to have helped with our reckless behaviors um, to create these nuclear disaster. What are your thoughts? Okay, uh, I, I think uh, that one of, the, one of the things that our New Paradigm Institute is going to be doing uh, in coming into Washington and setting up the offices is to call through a lot of these uh, stories that we have all been presented with and ascertain what the degree of truth is in all of these things. If, in fact, it can be established that that actually happened, that would be one more piece of evidence uh, to go into the catalog of evidence that exists that the actual occupants of the UFO vehicles are actually intending to help tutor us in how to get our way through this nuclear age, to come out the other side of this nuclear age without contaminating our planet, without destroying ourselves, uh, and without contaminating our, our species and, and mutating our species in some terrible way. Uh, so that, that there, there's an awful lot of information around which needs to be tested uh, you know, through the rules of civil procedure and the laws of admissibility of evidence, et cetera. The standards that we use at the New Paradigm Institute is just as though we're going to be doing a trial, just as though we're going to be following a Rule 11 preliminary investigation that it has to precede the filing of any particular complaint against the government. If we're going to be complaining about the, the unjust and illegal secrecy program, we've got to be able to craft a claim that specifically accuses them of what it is we think they're guilty of. And so we also need to be able to determine what facts we're going to be able to plead with a good faith basis for reasonably believing they're true. And so this issue about this, the, the stories, uh, we, ha we have to be careful of, of generating apocryphal tales about how benign these uh, extraterrestrial beings are, how caring they are, how concerned they are about our, our own safety and the preservation of life on our planet. Uh, I think that there's a lot of credibility to a lot of those stories, but we have to evaluate that. Uh, and uh, I would uh, hope that some of these things are true. I do know that there, and I've spoken directly with very credible witnesses who have asserted that when they have encountered a UFO craft and have been taken aboard a UFO craft, which I think they're credible in their accounts, have actually asserted that the beings telepathically communicate to them this 
constant refrain of asking us to get rid of the nuclear weapons uh, and the nuclear power plants that are threatening our people in the same way that they ask us to stop burning fossil fuels. They keep on saying that, you know, you're poisoning your planet with contamination uh, with your energy fields, uh, your energy fuels. So that these are two things that they've raised over and over again. Uh, and we're going to determine exactly how credible all of that information is, because while we would all love to believe that's true, I want to make sure that we're not supporting kind of a Pollyanna uh, attitude toward the UFO beings. We want to have clear-headed, clear-eyed diplomatic relations with these beings, uh, and we need to be realistic about what some of their intentions are here, and we don't know for sure yet. Thank you, Danny. Another excellent answer for that kind of a question, and we did stray off something, something real quick. Yes, I want to um, just make, Steve, just give me a quick second. I want to make one point of clarification for people who might be watching this, that this is all kind of new to them, because Danny's been using um, extraterrestrial civilization and civilizations, plural, almost interchangeably, but I think it's fair to say that it's pretty substantiated. There are more than one group of extraterrestrial um, civilizations that have been interacting with humanity, just kind of a point of clarification. Steve, go ahead with your remarks. I was just going to mention that if there's one person outside of the Soviet Union, Russia, that knows uh, is, uh, more than anybody else, it's it's Paul Stonehill. He, he has hundreds of videos on his YouTube channel, and he does address the Chernobyl event. Uh, and I, I, I encourage people to, to check out Paul's uh, uh, work on Soviet Union and Russia events. Thank you. Yes. And again, for people in the room, right on the other side of this wall, a lot of these resources exist. Third largest collection in the world of these these things right on the other side of that wall. Just had to get that in there. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. From uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, a man named X asks, and I'll, I'll direct this at both of the presenters here. Can you name the net? Well, I'm going to skip to the second part of this. And by the way, a lot of the questions that I'm rejecting, we've already covered or they're too far off topic. But this one is on topic, the second part of this. How many, um, re regarding the testimony of Gresh and others to the Congress, uh, how many UFO programs have now been identified? Can you provide more information and provide um, what you know? Uh, that's the question. What, what, how many UFO programs have now been identified? That might be one uh, for you, well, Steve. Well, I would tell you this, that, that uh, I was, I, w once I became legal counsel for Lou Elizondo, I was surprised to discover that there were a number of these programs that I'd never even heard about. Uh, and I've been at this since 1977. You know, I've been at this for like 46 years now. And, and I didn't know that these groups existed. Uh, uh, but there, that uh, in, this, in the statute that we have right now, there are 18 different uh, intelligence agencies uh, that are charged with responsibility for turning over the information that they have on UFOs, okay? And so that, that uh, I would suggest right now that there's 18 different entire departments or agencies inside the United States government that, are, that have these programs. Now, a lot of these programs are what they call unacknowledged special access programs. And the unacknowledged special access programs could be each each of the each of these eighteen intelligence agencies could have you know multiple programs inside them uh, that are dealing with different aspects of the UFO and ET question. So that my my sense is there are literally a couple there are dozens of these programs uh, that have been been compartmentalized that we have to open up. Uh, and extract the information from them and get them into the hands of the Senate and House Intelligence Committees. Thank you. Uh, Steve, how many programs? Um, Which ones I do you know about? Shocked. I would be shocked if we knew 5% of the programs. My question would be, which of our underground facilities has the most number of levels? <laughs> I mean, we, we're going to learn things over the next year and a half that are going to be quite stunning. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. Only, only ultimately the government can confirm this. And uh, I think it will certainly mo a lot. Of Thank you. I'm going to conclude the question period there. I'm really good about ending our events at nine o'clock. So I want to be respectful of everybody's time. By the way, these two men are volunteering their time here. They're, they're not being paid to volunteer to educate us. So let's just give them a round of applause real quick. <laughs> Do you get paid for doing this? I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs>
so I've just, just closing remarks, if you can. And uh, the subtitle of this lecture tonight was What's Next? So if you can just kind of look forward a little bit. And uh, Danny, you want to give that two or three minutes, please? Sure. Yeah, what's, what's, next? what's next? What's next is the list of uh, potential candidates for the membership in the nine person uh, UAP record review board. That uh, those are going to have to be prepared now. Uh, because they're going to have to go to the president because uh, President Biden is going to be required to present these names within 90 days of the passage of the bill. The, the first major date that we're looking at right now is December 22nd of 2023. This is the date by which the National Defense Authorization Act is going to be passed, uh, and we're going to have to then see what the full form is of this uh, this uh, uh, Schumer bill getting put into that National Defense Authorization Act. I'm hoping that what we're looking at here is substantially what's going to be going into that act. So then we're, we're going to have to submit, we have to submit within 45 days. I say we because our New Paradigm Institute is one of the groups that's been authorized by the statute to actually submit names to the president. Uh, and so that our institute is now working on a list of people to present uh, to the president. And uh, the statute uh, requires the president to review these names and to decide which of these people he wants to nominate. Uh, uh, he is authorized to select other people other than those that we, that we propose to him. But then the Congress, the Senate of the United States has 30 days from the time that he submits the, the names, 90 days after the passage of the statute, which would be right around March 21st of 2024, uh, that they have 30 days within which to hold hearings on those people, just like Senate, just like the Senate has to pass on Supreme Court appointments. Uh, and if, in fact, they reject any one of those people or more, then the president has 30 days to supply an additional person for that. Okay, and then the, once the once the committee is is appointed and in place. The agencies have 300 days, approximately one year, during which they are charged with responsibility for extracting every single piece of information their agency or department has ever possessed since January 1st of 1945 and collating it and putting it into a format that is retrievable and has digital recovery capacity. There's all kinds of mandates in the statute that they make it available, and then they have to turn it over to the uh, the board, uh, the records review board. Then the record review board has, uh, very, this is an extraordinarily important part of the bill. Any piece of information that has come from any of those government agencies or private military contractors that is more than 25 years old has to be released to the American public within 180 days. Wow. This covers Roswell, this covers Aztec, this covers uh, all kinds of the information. That provision is in this bill as of now. Anything that's been possessed over 25 years ago uh, from the date that it was first put, come into possession of the government has to be publicly released within 180 days unless the president himself, which will be Joe Biden, uh, orders it to be continually uh, postponed, okay? And then... Then the, the information that's turned over to the, uh, to the board, they have 90 days within which they have to file their report. Uh, they have to file a public report uh, that is going to be made public about what, how much documentation they've already acquired, what the schedule is for releasing all of this information, uh, and they have to get reports every 90 days. So there's all kinds of details in this statute that Stephen has, has, has made available to you now is up is now posted uh, and you go through it and you can actually figure out a calendar so that we have these points of, of December 22nd of 2023. We have the dates of uh, 45 days from then when we submit the nominees. We have the, the dates 90 days from that point of date uh, up into March 21st when the president has to submit it to, to, the, to the Senate. The Senate has 30 days to hold the hearings. This is, then there's another 300 days. We have a very specific calendar in front of us right now to answer that question of what's next. Uh, and we know that this is happening, but we're talking about basically one year. During that one year period, all of these agencies have to cough up this information and put it into the hands of this group. 
and then they have to release it within 180 days. This is this is a huge historical event that is taking place right as we we speak. And then any of the information that is withheld for any reason whatsoever has to go into a special program and they are ordered to present to the president a controlled disclosure campaign plan. That is the actual terminology in the statute. A controlled disclosure campaign plan has to be presented to the president. And all of this has to get done within a total of a seven-year period starting in 2024 because there's a sunset clause uh, on the life of this board. Thank you, Danny. That do you want to give you more information than people can? No, it's absorb. exciting. It's There's... the answer to the question. Thank you, Danny. Do you want to hold up that draft again just to get a visual about what you've been working on? And while you're yes. doing that, uh, is it appropriate that you name some of the new this, staff? This that... is the this is the this is the official bill right here. That it it's but it comes out backwards, I guess. There. Okay. We, we can and see the, it. And the one, it. the one that I, the one that I have, the one that I have. Uh, which was the original of the bill, uh, mine looks more like this, which has all of the dates alongside and all the details and uh, all the, the concrete steps that we have to take to make it all come into life. But that's, that's the bill, that you all, that's what we're all talking about here. That's what you wanna get a look at. And I can guarantee you that you will be delighted if you sit down and read through it. This, this copy that I have right here has more details in it, and this is actually uh, 64 pages long. This bill here, because it's in its official, it's in its official form that has every single line numbered, so that you can refer to every single line in the entire statute and its page number. Uh, so this is this is a working copy uh, of the bill right here that we have. Thank you. Do you want to um, uh, share with the audience here um, the staff that you've recently um, procured for your New Paradigm Institute back there in D.C.? Oh, yeah. No, we, we have, uh, we have uh, Dr. James Garrison is going to be our office director. Je uh, Dr. Garrison was my number two at the Jesuit National Headquarters. Uh, he was in charge of the nuclear weapons disarmament program uh, for our Jesuit order. He's the man that went to Russia uh, and met with uh, Brezhnev's people, then Andropov's people, and eventually with Gorbachev, and became the president of the Gorbachev Foundation, uh, and was the director, uh, along with Sarah Nelson, who's our executive director of the Romero Institute, of the State of the World Forum. Uh, he is where we brought the president, world presidents, retired presidents and vice presidents and secretaries of state and secretaries of defense together every year uh, at the end of the Cold War to try to develop a new, uh, more auspicious way of dealing with each other after the Cold War. Uh, and so we have him on board. We're going to have uh, uh, Richard Dolan is going to be the director of research uh, for us. Uh, he's offered to do anything we want. We're going to bring him on board. Uh, we have the office on Capitol Hill right now. Uh, and we, we've brought on a director of operations uh, that has been working for the Humanity Rising uh, group. We brought them on. We have uh, grants in place already uh, to fund bringing on more people. We also have uh, 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 various people from deep inside uh, the national intelligence community who are now on board as uh, consultants for us at a particular rate of, uh, of reimbursement that we've uh, gotten approved by our board. Uh, and I'm going to be meeting with more potential uh, funders of this uh, as of October 15th. So that's that's our operation, the New Paradigm Institute. It's at 110 Maryland Avenue, uh, right on Capitol Hill, next to the United States Supreme Court. Exciting, Danny. And that's newparadigminstitute.org that people can uh, learn about more about the work that Danny's doing. By the way, Sarah Nelson's Danny's wife, and they're both very accomplished people that are protecting our civil liberties their entire careers. For those people that might not know Dan Yoshian's background, with the Christic Institute and the Romero Institute, just easy to Google him. It's just, this man's just done tremendous things that too few people know about. All the work he's done with the Lakota People's Law Project, for example, to return. Uh, land and rights to the indigenous peoples. It's, it's in my opinion, it's a travesty that's not better known. So just had to put in a plug for Danny and all the great work he's doing. Another applause for you great men.
All right. Well, you see how hard I've been trying to keep us out of here by nine. We're already a few minutes after. Steve, what can you do? What, what do you want to say to wrap it all up for us, Steve? Go ahead. I'd just like to say this, that if you read the bills, all of the, the bills that have been passed since 2020, all the deadlines and reports and structure that's been set up, all of it is being done to service the post-disclosure world, not the pre-disclosure world. Because quite a few people in government know that the truth embargo is about to end. Uh, and in terms of what's next, none of the, 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 that's happening right now, including the bill, precludes the uh, more hearings, particularly the Senate intel. There's no reason not to have a Senate intel committee hearing. In my view of the strategy is the the extraordinary witness testimony that will come before the Senate Intel Committee sets the stage for the president to confirm the ET reality. And then all of this structure will be needed very much. And it's all ready to go. That's how I see what's about to happen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for valuing the information that we are all learning tonight. And I hope you can propagate this within your own communities, the thing that you learn here. And don't forget to check out our book collection. We can open the library for a minute, can't we? OK, thank you all. Thank you again to our presenters. Thank you, Grace. You've been a great friend and supporter for me. Thank you, Grace. Danny, I'll be calling the buggy soon. Our hope. Uh, I'll be here. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Don't, don't forget to send those Pallades books to Sarah. We, we mailed them this morning. They're already in the mail. They're in the mail to your office address. Terrific. Thank you, guys.